Okay, hey again, it's me, and now I'm going to be telling you more about particle physics. So today I'm going to focus on the particles and antiparticles. So, first of all, because I'm going to talk about antiparticles, we need to think about antimatter, okay? So, we need to know that whenever antimatter and matter particles meet, they destroy each other, which we are going to refer as annihilate, and radiation is released, okay? So, this happens every single time matter and antipart uh, sorry, antimatter meet. And then, antimatter, by definition, is when we have antiparticles, they have the same rest mass, equal and opposite charge to their corresponding particle okay this part is super important because if we know something about the particle we will then know the rest mass of the antiparticle the uh, uh the charge um of that antiparticle as well sorry i just got a little bit confused in there uh so antiparticles again they will have the same rest mass equal and opposite charge okay to their corresponding particle so how can we use this in real life? So for example, hospitals, they use PET scanners. And when I say PET scanners, it's standing for positron, which is the antiparticle of the electron, emission tomography. So what they do is uh, when you're doing a PET scan, the positron emitting isotope is given to the patient, okay? And it's going to uh, reach the patient's brain uh, within the bloodstream. So they get it, and then it's going to go on the blood, and then it's going to reach the brain. So each positron is emitted, is going to meet an electron, its antiparticle, and they will annihilate each other, okay? When this happens, as you will see in a little bit in this slide, two gamma photons are going to be produced, and they are going to be picked up by the de uh, detectors They are linked to computers. And then every time this is happening, the two photons are being uh, given, they are being detected, and gradually the image is produced. So, because I'm going to tell you about positron emission, I just want to recap on beta decay, okay? Um, beta was um, about two videos ago, so I spoke about beta decay in the stable and unstable nuclei, and I'm going to recap because you're going to see that the positron emission is actually quite similar, okay? Or if we know one well, we will know the other one quite well as well. So, in the beta decay, step one, the nucleus has too many neutrons, and therefore, the neutron in the nucleus is going to change into a proton, okay? So, when this happens, the beta particle is going to be created and emitted instantly, so it happens straight away, and at the same time, I get an antiparticle, let me take this away, an antiparticle, which is the antineutrino, that's going to be the symbol, the mu, and then the hat, the line showing that is an antiparticle, and the antineutrino is emitted and because it's an antineutrino or actually well because it's a neutrino it has no charge and the particle of the neutrino is the antineutrino so again has opposite charge opposite charge of no charge is no charge okay so that's the actual equation for the beta decay so i have the x nucleus it gives me the y nucleus plus the beta particle plus the antineutrino if you don't know how to get these numbers, go to the video called Stable and Unstable Nuclei because I explain how you get these numbers, okay? Now, let's compare to the positron emission. So, in the positron emission, what is happening? First of all, the nucleus has too many protons. So look, first, nucleus has too many neutrons. Now, in the positron emission, the nucleus has too many protons. Now, you can guess what is happening. Now, the proton in the nucleus is going to change into a neutron. So again, beta decay neutron changes into a proton, positron, em positron sorry, emission, I have the proton changing into a neutron. So now, instead of getting the beta particle, I'm going to have the positron, so I'm going to get the antiparticle, okay? So I can refer to the positron with any of these two symbols, so beta, top number, so mass number zero, uh, atomic number plus one, or beta with a plus on the top, which is the antiparticle of the electron, okay? The positron is emitted. Look how similar, but at the same time opposite, let's say, the processes are. And uh, I'm pretty sure you can guess step number four, which is then the neutrino, which also has no charge, is going to be emitted, okay? So the beta decay and the positron emission, they are really similar. So if you know one well, you know the other one well as well. 
So again, I start with the X and it gives me the Y nucleus. Everything is the same so far. And then now I get a positron, so zero plus one. Look, before it was zero minus one. Plus, now the symbol, the mu, which is standing for the neutrino, while before I would have an antineutrino. So really quickly again, nucleus has too many neutrons, in a positron, nucleus has too many protons. Beta decay, neutron changes into a proton. Positron emission, proton changes into a neutron. Beta decay, when this happens, I get a beta particle and an antineutrino. Positron emission, when this happens, I get a positron and a neutrino, okay? Again, the way you get the numbers is exactly the same as before. These numbers, A, Z, A, Z minus one, zero plus one, go on the stable and unstable nuclei um, video two videos ago, I think, if you're not sure how to do this stuff. Now, I'm going to tell you about Einstein and Dirac because they really helped in this stuff, okay? So, what did Einstein do? Einstein, he showed that the mass of a particle increases the faster this, uh, it travels, okay? And he gave us this super hooper formula, E equals mc squared. He said as well that a particle has a rest mass, which we are going to refer as m0, okay? So zero for standing, not standing, not moving, being stationary. And then he said that a particle has a rest energy. So if it has a rest mass, it has a rest energy, which is m zero c squared, okay? And finally, he said that the rest energy must be included in the conservation of energy. So when we look at these decays and emissions, we need to include those in the calculations for them to go and make sense, okay? Dirac, so he predicted the existence of the antimatter and he also said that it would unlock the rest energy whenever a particle and the corresponding anti antiparticle meet and destroy each other or, as is written in here, annihilate, which is kind of the key word, the way we should talk about it, okay? So, Dirac's theory of antimatter, he said, or antiparticles, as is written in there, so he said, for every type of particle, there is going to be a corresponding antiparticle that, number one, annihilates the particle and itself if they meet, converting their total mass into photons. Number two, it has exactly the same rest mass as the particle. Number three, has exactly the opposite charge to the particle, okay? And Dirac also predicted uh, something else, which is what we are going to call the pair production. So where the pair particle and antiparticle are produced, okay? So in the pair production, you have a photon that has enough energy, we are going to look at this energy in a second, that could pick up all this energy and change it into a particle and an antiparticle pair. So create both the particle and the antiparticle, okay? And they would separate from each other. So here is two things that Dirac predicted. A, annihilation. So in here I have an antiparticle and a particle. They meet, they destroy each other and release energy. So they annihilate each other and they release energy. Each of them releases a photon. So I have one photon going up in here, one photon going down in here. And then Dirac also um, spoke about the pair production. So he predicted this would happen. And in the pair production, I have a photon that has enough energy to produce not just a particle, but the particle and the antiparticle, okay? They need to come in pairs. And when the photon would produce this, they would go, this particle and antiparticle, they would go in separate directions or separate from each other. So how do I get to know how this works. So how do I get to know the formulas to see either which energy I get or which energy the photon must have for me to get the particles and the antiparticles being formed? So first of all, I need to tell you about uh, electron volts, okay? And when I say about electron volts, I mean that one electron volt is the energy that is transferred when an electron is moved through a potential difference of one volt, okay? That's the definition. When we're doing these calculations about particles, antiparticles, our um, results, our numbers are going to be in the order of the MEV, which stands for Mega Electron Volt. And for you to have an idea and to convert into joules, one MEV, so one Mega Electron Volt, so one times 10 to the power of six electron volts, equals to 1.60 times 10 to the power of minus 13 joules, okay? 
because again, one electron volt is going to be 1.60 times 10 to the power of minus 19, but because now I have times 10 to the power of 6 here, I get times 10 to the power of minus 13 in here, okay? So that's how you convert. Now, annihilation, if you think about the previous slide, you would have a particle meeting an antiparticle and two photos be given, right? So that means that I have two HF minimum, so the energy of the photons equals to 2E0, so the rest energy of the particle and the antiparticle. These two twos happen to cancel each other, so the minimum energy of each photon that is going to be produced in the annihilation process is going to be HF minimum, which is equal to E0, so the rest mass of the particle or antiparticle. When I have a pair production, I have a photon that is now creating the particle and the corresponding antiparticle that have a rest energy of E0, okay? Each of them has this rest energy. So I now need to have that the minimum energy for that photon needs to be HF minimum that needs to be enough to give the particle and the antiparticle. So two different things. That's why the two is coming in here. And I can say two is zero because again, because they are matter and antimatter, they happen to have the same rest mass. So I have two of E0, two of the same. So, oh, sorry, I didn't want to go that fast. So that's how you calculate then the minimum energy of the photon that you need to get that going, okay? Now, to do a quick exercise, just to make sure that we get this right. So they say, calculate the minimum energy of a photon for a pair of production of an electron and a positron, so particle and antiparticle. And then they say the rest energy of an electron is not 0.511 mega electron volts, so 10 to the power of 6 electron volts, okay? So they told me the rest energy of the electron, meaning that the rest energy of the positron is exactly the same, okay? Because it's the electron's antiparticle. So because I'm getting a pair production, let me go back to the previous slide, I'm going to use this formula, HF minimum, the minimum energy that I need for my photon, must be 2E0, the rest energy. And again, I need this because this is what I'm doing. One photon is giving two particles, okay? Sorry, going back and forth. You can always pause the video if you need to take notes. So what do I do? HF minimum is going to be 2E0, again, two times the rest energy of the particles. So I get two times uh, 0 0.511, where this is going to be the rest energy of the electron and the positron, right? Because they are the pair particle and antiparticle. And this would give me, if I do the calculations, 1.022 mega electron volts, okay? And then if I want to convert it into joules, then I just need to multiply by 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 13. And if I do so, I get that the energy for that photon is going to be 1.64 times 10 to the power of minus 13 joules, okay? Finally, you must know that that's going to be the minimum energy for that particular photon to produce the electron and the positron. So if you have a photon with less energy than that, it cannot create a positron and an electron, okay? Because it must have enough, en enough energy sorry, to produce the electron and the corresponding antiparticle, which is the positron. That's where the 2E0 comes from, okay? So that's all now for particles and antiparticles. Keep tuned to see more about particle physics. And I'm going to go now. So bye. Whoopsie.